Hi everybody and welcome to White Collar Crime. I'll be your professor this semester. My name is Dr. Joshua Beal and please feel free to let me know if you have any questions. You can leave them right in the comments of this video um, and I will try and answer them as quickly as possible. So when people think of white collar crime, they think of a lot of different ideas about white collar crime. There was a really popular TV show called White Collar that really kind of did a disservice, if you will, to what white collar crime actually is. Basically, the TV show made it seem like crime committed by rich people is white collar crime. And that is not necessarily the truth, right? Um, you know, we see here in the picture, we've got someone stealing art. Is stealing art white collar crime? Or is that just theft, right? And so it's an important distinction straight away, right out of the gate at the beginning of the semester, to actually have an operational definition or define what white collar crime actually is. So when we think of crime, we typically think of crime like street crime, right? Murder, rape, theft, vandalism, burglary, robbery, assault, battery, right? These are when we think of crime typically what we think crime is. And also when we typically think of the criminal, we typically think of them being some sort of disenfranchised group or bad group. Maybe it's the poor or the dispossessed segments of society, or even some theoretical ideas about psychopaths or something psychologically different about criminals versus non-criminals, right? Um, that's not necessarily the case in white-collar offending, right? And the first, uh, you know, chapter in, in most white-collar crime textbooks will talk about this difference of crimes in the streets versus crimes in the suites, right? And this is this idea that there's street crime, which is everything we've mentioned before, and then there's also this kind of corporate or governmental deviance that happens in society that we don't typically think of, right? Even though white-collar crimes are the most expensive in terms of cost, they hurt society more than most other types of crimes, and actually can end up even causing death more than any other crime, we typically still don't think of white-collar offenses when we think of crime. So what is white-collar crime? Basically, in a nutshell, white-collar crimes are crimes of greed, right? Greed for more money or power by people who typically have both already. The white-collar criminal also is unique compared to the street criminal because they tend to elicit less sympathy, right? If you think of someone who is stealing because they're very, very poor, we tend to at least be able to rationalize that or understand that. Well, you're, you don't have a lot of money, maybe you need to steal to feed your family, right? Versus a million dollar salary CEO, right, who is embezzling money from his company to buy his second or third plane, right? We don't have a whole lot of sympathy for the one percenter that is committing uh, white collar crime. And white collar crime goes by a bunch of different names. You may have heard it called upper world crimes, maybe economic crimes, crimes of the powerful. All of that is going to kind of fall under this white collar umbrella. They all also have similar behaviors too. There's typical ripoffs of consumers, maybe antitrust violations, healthcare fraud, right, embezzlement. Um, so there's all sorts of different um, behaviors that are all committed by this group uniquely. So what are some other examples of white-collar crimes and what are some of the like characteristics of white-collar crime? Well, as I've already mentioned, white-collar crime is actually very similar to street crime in a lot of ways, right? White-collar crime can be violent. For example, hundreds of people dying from a faulty design of a product, right? There are famous examples like the Ford Pinto or even more recently um, Tylenol tablets, right, that were laced with arsenic, right? Hundreds of people died in both of those cases because of this corporate uh, neglect or deviance. Crimes can also be property crimes. How often do we see commercials for asbestos-related um, diseases and mesothelioma, right? Um, that is a, a property crime, right? Crimes can also be monetary. They can cost consumers hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. If the government does something that's a little bit sketchy, it can literally cost the taxpayers hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars a year in that governmental deviance. Now, in studying white-collar crime, we're actually fortunate to live in the time and the place that we do live because white-collar crime has had a very erratic history. This was first brought to the attention, right, or the idea or concept of white-collar crime was first developed by Edwin Sutherland in 1939. So this is at the outbreak of 
World War II, the war in Europe has just begun, and Edwin Sutherland is the president of the American Sociological Society, and he stands up in his presidential address and says there's a type of deviance we're not addressing here, and it's something we need to look at carefully, and it's this white-collar crime. And in this address, Sutherland stated that theorists currently could not adequately, and by currently I mean at that time, in 1939, could not adequately explain crime without studying crimes by the well-heeled. And the major points were... Business crime is really no different than Al Capone and his legitimate rackets, right? In fact, if you look at or think about a lot of different types of corporations even, or, or, or business entities, right, and you look at the mob, there's not really necessarily that big of a difference, right? It's, it's illegal for the mob to loan somebody money and then charge them too high of an interest rate. However, how many people have student loans that get loaned money at high interest rates, right? It's illegal for the mob to go into a company and say, hey, if anyone messes with your business, we'll protect you. Let us know. We've got your back. Just pay us a little bit of money. Isn't that exactly what an insurance company is? And so Sutherland's arguing there's really not a substantive difference between these criminal enterprises and what corporations do on a very regular basis. He also argues that white-collar crime is immune to a lot of this because the, of class bias of the courts and the implementation of an administration of the law, right? The reason we don't like what the mob does is because at the time especially, we had this strong anti-Italian sentiment in America, right? We did not like these Italians coming over to America and trying to work in our jobs, right? America had a long history of not necessarily loving certain types of immigrant groups, right? And so... Um, White-collar offenses are largely immune to a lot of these issues because of that. Uh, political crimes also o almost always involve businesses, but only politicians get in trouble. The business leaders are always safe. And really, even at its worst, what typically happens to business leaders? At worst, they're fired from their business position when we find out they do some sort of deviance. And then maybe a few weeks later or a few months later, they apologize and they're running some other company, right? So Sutherland actually argued that any endeavor whose goal is profit maximization will be tainted by criminality, right? Illegal acts are more likely when the profit seeker is powerful and agents of control and the means at their disposal are weak, right? And so basically anyone whose goal is to make a lot of money, right, and if you have a lot of power and not a lot of oversight, it's a breeding ground for um, white-collar offenses, Currently, what theory of law or criminality supports this idea? Really, the only one is maybe conflict theory, right? But strain theory doesn't make a lot of sense because that talks about lower SES um, individuals, social disorganization is in the same boat. Social learning and control theory talks about individuals' bonds to society and who they interact with. That's not really a great definition. Rational choice and deterrence don't really make sense. So a lot of the theoretical orientations of the time just really didn't do a great job of explaining this type of deviance. Well, why isn't corporate crime more common then? If the goal of, if any organization whose goal is profit maximization is um, going to be criminal, right, then why aren't more corporations uh, actually deviant, right? Some have argued that maybe there's a justice or morality element to this. Some uh, believe that these corporations have enough. We'll learn over the course of the semester that actually the vast majority of corporations do at some point or another in the course of their running actually violate either regulatory or legal uh, prohibitions. And so in fact, corporate crime is actually significantly more common than we think. Even though corporate crime is very, very common, why doesn't it bother us, right? A quote from um, Geismeyer and Salinger on page three of their kind of seminal text in White Collar Crime suggests that the crime of business, after, after all, is that it perpetuates a culture of self-interest through this ethos of self-realization, right? So basically, other social institutions may have issues, but their primary aim is to actually help others, right? If you think about social institutions in our society, our educational system, yeah, maybe there are some for-profit schools or, or money to be made in education, but really the purpose of education is to make society smarter, 
right? Our health care system. Yeah, their doctors are making a lot of money, hospital CEOs and executive boards are making a lot of money, but what's the true point of the healthcare industry? To help people that are sick, right? Businesses don't really hide what their primary goal is, and that's to make money, right? When a doctor violates trust, that is terrible to us, right? We get very upset about it because this is a person that we are supposed to trust. However, when a business violates trust or does something sketchy, we all just kind of rationalize it away by saying, well, they're kind of doing their jobs. Or, of course, Microsoft tried to drive Apple out of business. They're competitors with each other. They're fighting for market share. So, of course, they're trying to do whatever they can to be the big boys on top. So there are three main periods of white-collar crime study that are pretty important, right? From 1939, when Edwin Sutherland first proposed this idea, all the way up to 1963, white-collar crime was viewed with skepticism and really was only studied by those with ties to Sutherland. Sutherland kind of came out guns blazing, saying there's this type of crime we've all ignored because our theories can't explain it. That's our fault as criminologists and sociologists. We should have done a better job about this, but we need to have this other type of crime here to re and, and have our theories fit that in order to have a full picture of crime. Obviously, a lot of criminologists did not like that, right? Um, they were not particularly happy that he was kind of calling them all out for this lack of, of the uh, ex explanatory power by their theories. And um, during this time, the main focus was on the nature of the offense rather than why they happened. So at this point, we're trying to decide, well, what is embezzlement really? What is fraud? What is... Um, any of these other kind of white-collar uh, offenses we talk about, securities issues or anything else, right? Then, from 1964 to 1975, there was this interesting 10 to 11-year period where social science in interest in white-collar crime almost completely disappears. And this is one of those interesting areas where you can't really remove anything from the social environment of the time. Right? And this is where it's so critically important, why social scientists are so important to our society. Right, What was going on in the 60s and 70s? Well, the Vietnam War was. Why did we fight the Vietnam War? We didn't particularly like communists, right? We didn't want communism spreading. To now have researchers coming out there and talking publicly about how corporations and businesses might be a little bit sketchy, suddenly starts having the sounds of communism a little bit, right? We need more government to police these corporations. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You want to expand the government? You know what a fully expanded government is? Communism. And so academics were largely uninterested in even trying to continue pursuing white-collar offenses and white-collar crime study because there was fear of being labeled a communist, and you could actually get taken before the Senate and tried and potentially convicted as a communist if you were critical of businesses too much. Then from 75 to present day is kind of this contemporary period where white-collar crime became popular again as the rise of conflict theory and also labeling theory um, became more popular, and this also coincided with world events like Vietnam ending and also Watergate happened, right, with President Nixon. When Watergate happened, it was suddenly the, a beautiful example of governmental deviance. Here's a president spying on the other president's campaign. This is highly problematic, right, and kind of shows that those in power are doing sometimes some sketchy things. Also on the rise during this contemporary period is this kind of Marxist belief about upper class privilege and their abuses, and that also kind of helped, right? Today in society, if you were to ask a lot of people what their opinion of socialism is, they're going to have a much more positive opinion about it today than they are in the 60s and 70s. In fact, the Occupy Wall Street movement that took place uh, a couple of years ago would have never happened in the, in the 60s and 70s because it would have been viewed as way too socialist or therefore kind of transitively communist and and way too critical of a of the government and those in power. So as early as 500 years ago, there were some enforced business crimes. Uh, crimes that businesses have committed or the idea of regulatory regulating businesses is not necessarily new. There were certain crimes like regrading, which was basically buying up market commodities in order to resell for a profit. 
that was viewed as a bad thing, even 500 years ago. What, what happens after hurricanes in Florida? People buy up all the water and then stand out on the street corner and charge five, six, seven dollars a bottle of water. Even 500 years ago, we, we didn't like that much, right? We thought that was a little bit sketchy. There's also this idea of engrossing, right? This is a wholesale purchase with the intent to resell at a monopoly rate. Let me buy up a bunch of this at a cheaper price and then try and resell it if I own all of it from a bunch of different wholesalers. So for example, if I was, say, Walmart, I buy up all the corn in America from wholesalers, from the farmers, with the intent to resell it. No one else has any corn. I can resell it at a higher monopoly rate. There's also this idea of forestalling, which is just kind of an umbrella term for this these aforementioned offenses, which is just when businesses are doing things that don't sit right with the public ethic. In the late 1500s, what kind of brought some of this about is drought and food shortages that brought about anger toward the wealthy, right? Granted, the wealthy argued this is foresight on our part to store grain for the times of need, right? We we learn about, you know, the ant and the grasshopper, right? Don't, we all remember that nursery rhyme, the grasshopper's jumping around all day, flipping around, enjoying himself while the ant stores up food for the winter. Winter comes, the grasshopper's like, hey, I need some food. And the ant goes, you should have thought about that when you were flipping around doing all, all your grasshoppery things, right? So the wealthy argue this is just foresight. Those that are starving to death are saying, well, maybe it is foresight, but we're starving to death. You should probably share some of that with us. Also, there's another wrinkle to this, right? In order to have the, even if you have the foresight to store up all this food, what else do you need in order to do it? Well, you need money to buy the food and space to store it. Saying to someone who has no money or no space, well, you just should have stored up more food is also viewed as a little insulting because it shows kind of how out of touch people are with society. Everyone remembers the famous Marie Antoinette quote, so let them eat cake. What was that in reference to? Well, the French were all very, very pissed off because it was a famine in France at the time, and the royal family was living very, very posh, very, very luxurious lives. She was told, Marie Antoinette was told by some of her subordinates, hey, they're really upset that you still serve cake at dinner. And she said, well, I don't understand. We have an outlaw, basically what she was saying, I, I, we didn't say it's illegal to eat cake. Let them have cake. If they want cake, tell them that they can eat cake. Completely missing the point that, in fact, the issue was they couldn't afford food to make a cake while she was having these indulgences in her life. So the basic kind of thrust and argument of, of Sutherland in this um, first kind of explanation of white-collar crime is that most explanations of crime do not explain white-collar offenses. White-collar offenses also indicate the distribution of power in society. Why are these corporate leaders allowed to get away with stuff that no one else is? It also portrays the way power is exercised illegitimately in society. There's also a degree of hypocrisy present in society, right? We like to have this idea of Lady Justice being this blind person holding her weight up and seeing which side tips to the side of justice, right? The reality is there's kind of a hypocrisy present. Justice matters or justice, you're at the mercy of justice only if you're poor. If you're wealthy, you kind of help create justice. It also illustrates changes in social and business life, right? We started to see this idea as these big corporations became more powerful, as the robber barons and, and the millionaires of old were kind of flaunting their wealth and their extravagancies, right? That upset people, and there was a push to try and not allow that to happen. This idea of the 1% is not a new idea in American history, or really in world history in any sense. And also it uh, furnishes material helpful for an understanding of changes in social values. As our society changes, we kind of ebb and flow with whether or not we like these idea, this idea of extravagant wealth or we don't, right? In some circles of society, even today, people argue, I love the fact that America allows millionaires and billionaires because it gives me something to strive for. Other people argue that having millionaires or billionaires is a perfect litmus test for how sick the society actually is in need of a cure. Anyway, I hope you found this all um, informative and helpful. And like I said, if you have any questions, please just drop them down below. You can even timestamp them so I know exactly what you're talking about, and I'd be happy to answer them.